Okay, welcome to a very special lecture in the Otara University of Commerce English Lecture Series. This is our 50th lecture, and today we are pleased to welcome Mr. Shigeru Yoshida. Uh, he is the president of uh, SEA, the School for Educational Alternatives in Sapporo, and the topic of his talk today is Japanese English Education is Almost Crime, Lessons from My Total Teaching Experience. Please welcome Mr. Shigeru Yoshida. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be here to talk to you guys. And uh, the title of my lecture or talk, with you, not to you, is, is Japanese education, I mean, J a Japanese English education a crime or not, right? And, uh, well, that's a kind of hook, okay? I tricked you in, right? So we need something sensational. Actually, Mr. Nakatsugawa and I, I mean, I was asked by uh, Mr. Nakatsugawa, contacted by Mr. Nakatsugawa about the, this lecture series uh, last February, I guess. And uh, oh, I, I said, okay, yes. You know, I'll accept the offer, and then uh, he got in touch with me last October, and uh, I said, what's going to be your title? He said, okay, at that time I was reading a book uh, written by Mr. Mikitani, the owner and founder of Rakuten, and he wrote, his company uh, dec uh, decided to use English as their uh, official language, and he wrote a book called uh, English. It's only English, but it's English, right? And uh, in that book, he said, I mean, he is sort of like a discussing how uh, worthless Japanese English education is and so on. And he said, Japanese English educa education is almost a crime. I kind of thought it was a catchy, catchy ring to use for my speech. And uh, today it's uh, assignment for us is to kind of explore the Japanese in, uh, English education in relation to uh, the attitude of young Japanese towards uh, international community in academics or in business or in politics and so on. So uh, I don't mean to be here to give any, you know, thoughts to you or try to give you some uh, uh, some of my dear ideas. Or I'm, I'm not. Uh, I don't mean to do that. I'm here to sort of discuss with you and think about the future of this country in relation to the future of young people in general. Okay, and it's so nice to have some of the uh, international students here to sort of like a, uh, discuss student life here in Japan in comparison uh, to the student life in your home countries. Okay, so well, since I used uh, the uh, Japanese English education is a crime, almost a crime, as a title. I'll take responsibility to discuss uh, that topic later on. But, I mean, when I give a lecture, I tend to sort of focus on topic too much, but, uh, you know, that sometimes doesn't work. So, let me introduce myself, okay, in relation to international communication and in relation to English education. I have been involved in uh, uh, preparing Japanese uh, youth for international studies. I mean, <coughs> uh, studying abroad for the last 35 years. Basically, we uh, trained uh, young Japanese, especially high school graduates for TOEFL uh, training, SAT, and G, uh, for, in the case of uh, undergraduate students for G, GMAT <coughs> and GRE. And uh, of course, we work on the uh, academic placement as well. We select uh, appropriate schools for uh, young Japanese students to study uh, in 
respective English-speaking countries, England, Canada, of course, US, Ireland, sometimes, sometimes Hong Kong, sometimes Philippines, Singapore. So we've been doing that for the last 35 years. And we have sent a uh, little over 1,000 students to different English-speaking uh, universities. But that's, uh, I mean, that's a, a good job. I, I'm interesting. But that's, uh, I mean, that kind of job just sort of put me into the conflict of sort of, okay, why do I have to send young students abroad, you know? Why can't we accommodate them in the same kind of education, uh, education setup here in Japan? So I have a little bit of frustration. So uh, my background for international education and English communication goes back farther. I mean, when I was young, I start to remember, why am I so stimulated by the, uh, uh, different cultures and so on? I lived in, I mean, I was uh, born and raised in a very small town in Tokachi, the farther east of Obihiro. And the population of my town at that time was like 3,000 people. And the only uh, so-called foreigner I saw was a, a Christian missionary and his family, right? And we sort of encountered him every once in a while. That's about it. That was my first encounter with him, uh, someone who didn't look like us. Then, uh, when I became junior high school, I found out that my grandma's sister was married to an American guy and living in Wyoming. And my grandma showed me some of the newspaper clips sent uh, to her from Wyoming. And uh, she thought I could understand something, so I tried to read and check and explain uh, uh, what the newspaper clips said to my grandma. So that was a kind of connection I had, right? But I never thought I would be studying in college in the United States later on. Okay, the time has come in the, uh, I don't know, long before you guys were born. It was like a late 1960s. Uh, Japanese universities became very radical. Uh, and student movements start, first start in uh, tuition hike at the, some of the private schools and uh, uh, lots of left, leftist students started to, you know, uh, make a movement against uh, authoritarian uh, policy making at the universities and uh, many students uh, and many universities went on strike. And, Closed schools were closed down. Even Hokudai, I don't think, did, uh, had an entrance examination in that year. That was 1970. And uh, I started to read Marx at the age of 16. And my parents got freaked out. My God, my son is turning red. <laughs> right. And, uh, well, at that time, high school life was interesting. We had a different mix of teachers, you know, lots of activities. Uh, had become a, a high school teacher. And uh, in my math class, our math class teacher promised that if we study hard and if we have the highest average in math test among like, 11 classes, class, then he said we would be able to play softball for the, re for the rest of the semester without studying math. So what we did was we got together, studied really hard, helping each other. We can maintain our, our highest our class average for math class, and uh, we spent uh, all the math classes for the rest of actually year playing softball, playing soccer outside. And when it rained, okay, when it rained. He talked about his student activities and how to destroy the you know, government and so all the time. <laughs> he implanted us all the revolutionary thoughts to us. And I was one of the few guys who got really high on that and started to read Marx, Marx and uh, all those left, leftist literature. Yeah, so uh, that was a kind of a, okay, uh, turning around for my life. And, uh, 
And uh, my parents started to worry that if you know, I had continued studying in Japan, I would end up in a jail <laughs> for, what do you call it, uh, uh, for using uh, arms to destroy government or whatever. <laughs> and he started to worry about uh, my career and because uh, I mean, he found many uh, leftist literatures in my room and so on. So he talked to people around, uh, around our neighborhood and there's a guy uh, who had a friend teaching at American University. And uh, so through his uh, neighbor, he, my father found a connection to American college. And uh, it was like second year, towards the second year, towards the end of the second year, high school, my father asked me to sit, <coughs> sit with him, said, okay, do you want to get busted in this country by continuing your, uh, you know, political activities abroad or political studies, or do you want to go abroad to study? Okay, I'll give you enough money to, you know, uh, continue education here in Japan for four years that you can use your education outside. I don't know. I mean, I didn't have much thought. Okay, well, sounds, sounds interesting. So I took the deal. Okay, and I, uh, through my father's, uh, I mean, our neighbor's connection, I was accepted to a small liberal, co liberal arts college up north uh, of New York City. Up, uh, we call that upstate New York, right? Small liberal arts college. And uh, that's how I sort of started my what you, global experience. And uh, life is interesting, you know. In my second year, or sorry, third year in my college, I had another Marxist teacher in America. He was a sociologist. And uh, since I had some you know, preparation for Marxism, right, and he taught Marx, the kind of sociology that only lasted for like, several years in the United States, Marxist sociology. So I became a top student, right? <laughs> but that was a trap in my life, right? And uh, so I started to have a, uh, completely different ideas <clears throat> from other students. I, and that was a um, hippie era. I don't know whether you, uh, I mean, that's oh. a dead word, but hippie era in the United States, 1970, 19, uh, 75, 6, yeah. But great music came out, you know. <laughs> I'm sure your parents listen to all those music all the time, right? Like uh, Doobie Brothers, that's 70s, like the Flat Sweat and Tears in Chicago and all those, I mean, great music. Anyway, uh, I got involved in uh, lots of like, student activities while in, I was in college and my Professor, Marxist professor said, classroom wouldn't teach you anything, so go out, do something, get yourself organized, okay, and try to fight against the school authorities, so we organize the class, right? And if we boycott the class, we get an A. <laughs> Crazy time. Crazy time. But I learned how to organize, my, uh, you know, mobilize students, and we had like a, uh, we had a second student government, I was the president, and uh, we worked on dorm reform and all those things, and of course we worked together with Native Americans. At that time, uh, uh, Native Americans started to, uh, you know, uh, make appeal to the U.S. government for uh, breaking 700, uh, some treaties that the U.S. government had made with the Native, speak, uh, Native Americans. Native Americans after the black, I mean, after Americans, they started to make very strong stand against the government policies. And so we worked together with us, uh, Native Americans from South Dakota and North Dakota. And uh, of course, uh, we worked with uh, many women's organizations for the uh, uh, liberation of whatever. I mean, <laughs> whatever. You, of course, women at that time was discriminated in various areas. But, uh, I mean, we just, if you think about it, we just, you know, wanted to project our 
of frustration towards the society using any means available. Yeah. And I'm glad I didn't have to join the Black Panther. Do you remember Black Panther? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's my background. So, I mean, after finishing my college, you know, I mean, if you go through that kind, you have no notion of working for the corporation, right? I mean, if you work for the corporation, I know I would become a troublemaker, for sure. I mean, and uh, I didn't want to uh, be a troublemaker at all, so I decided to be independent. You know, to be independent. And uh, I had opportunity to travel to Malaysia and spend uh, six months in a small island called Penang, where I uh, was looked after by overseas Chinese whose family was saved by Japanese military during the wartime. Strange family. So he says, I owe Japanese. Actually, you guys are enemy. You killed my people, but uh, Personally, I owe you, your people something, so you take back what I owe you. Okay, I'll get, get you anything you like, but Cadillac. I said, <laughs> but Cadillac. I said, okay, I want to have a Fender guitar, electric guitar. He traveled to Sapporo with a heavy Fender guitar he, that he picked up in Hong Kong, and whenever I visit him, he gives me money, okay, money to spend. Okay, and uh, he buys me a piece of gold, 22 karat gold things. Okay, if I give you too much money, you're gonna spend it all. So take those gold. You, whenever you're in trouble, just take those gold stuff to the pawn shop and you can live for a while. So he and I became really good friends. It's like a father and son relationship. Yeah. And uh, I learned quite a bit about, <coughs> from him about the Japanese brutality during the Second World War in Malaysia. That was like 1977, and the uh, Japanese government admitted the military brutality in, during the war in Southeast Asia towards the late 80s, 1980s. So I have first-hand knowledge about the Japanese brutality and what, are we, what, what we did, and what we did to the people uh, in the region. Anyway, that's my background, and uh, so, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I knew I couldn't work for the, uh, you know, uh, corporations, I couldn't work for the government, so I had to become independent, and uh, how, what we did was, what I did was, like, uh, after I came back from Malaysia, my um, godfather, Chinese godfather told me, okay, don't go work for the corporation, I mean, you will be a dangerous figure. So, try to work uh, for yourself by starting some small businesses. What can I do? S start a juku or English, small English school, and you, you, I'm sure you can survive. In the, and uh, that's, uh, I mean, I sort of accepted his uh, uh, advice and uh, decided to work for some private language school. And my mom's dream was that to see off her son in a suit at her <laughs> door. <laughs> that was a long time dream, but uh, uh, I wore a t-shirt and jeans and went to work for uh, this English uh, conversation school for children. And the uh, interesting thing was like our life is designed for what you kind of wish for. The company went bankrupt in two weeks. <laughs> and we have to look after 400 students for uh, no salary and just for, you know, you know kind of like self-esteem that, okay, we have to look after these, these kids for the society. That then those businessmen who run away with the money. And that's where I met my wife. Yeah, so that was, uh, this is my wife Mickey. Yeah, <laughs> we've been married for, uh, we've been kind of ma married. <laughs> we, she had her school to look after, I had my school to look after. We decided to combine two schools together, and, and we decided to combine our lives together too. Very convenient. Yeah, very convenient, <laughs> yeah. So she's been my business partner for the last 35 years. Anyway, that's my background. And uh, so I've been in the line, uh, being in 
private, uh, what do you call it, language, English education for 35 years, and I have been constantly fighting with a, a public school English education. But I don't mean to criticize anybody, because language learning, or, I mean, life itself is something you have to be responsible for, right? You, I mean, that includes everything you have, everything you own, everything you do. But it is worthwhile analyzing what's happening around us, right? So that's where we start. And this is called mind map. Wow, it's almost 20 minutes. <laughs> have you seen this mind map? Okay, this is created by uh, and a, a British educator named Tony Buzan, and we used mind map to help our students take notes for the listening. And this, I don't know how much we can follow this, okay? Our hook today is, okay, is Japanese education really a crime, almost a crime or not? We discussed about that. But what we really want to discuss today, as I said earlier, is why are young Japanese so hesitant about studying? The reason I want to focus on this later on is that, as I said earlier, I'm really worried about the future of this country. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you got some of you are from different countries, and uh, you know, when you think about your home country, it's like a love and hate feeling, right? Love and hate, and and you have to take <coughs> responsibility for love part and hate part, and you have to speak up, right? But today, in order to follow this and to reach this our, our, goal, our goal of discussion, I'd like you to sort of like, uh, choose some participants and do a little bit of like a independent speech in TOEFL style because I, uh, I mean, TOEFL teaching is my uh, expertise and I've been doing that long enough almost to get sick about it, right? <laughs> so I'll do a little technique. I, usually, when we do independent such speech, I use this, right? And, uh, okay. Japanese English education is almost crime. Do you agree or disagree, okay? And who agrees? Raise your hand. Almost cry. Okay. Who disagree? Nobody disagrees. This is not fun. Then I disagree. Okay, you agree. It's a crime. I disagree. I take different position. Or I want someone to take different position. Is there anyone who's willing to take disagree position? Just for the sake. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay. So we need. Okay. So then, I'll choose someone to argue with you, okay? <laughs> okay? So, you agree, right? Can you hit one little key? Can you make a, like a, okay, one minute speech? Why you agree with the statement, with the de supporting details? Please. Ready? Go. I begin now? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Right now, now, now. Now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, now right I'll give you 10 seconds. <laughs> Go. Okay. For my part, if I disagree, it's because uh, the, method, the method of teaching is mostly how to read how to write, but when it's about pronunciation and practice, nothing. So their pronunciation is not really good. They have um, a lot of problem to find their word because they are not used to practice. So they uh, don't trust themselves, they have a lack of self-confidence, they are shy. So it put more barrier, barrier. There's almost the one of the language, now they have the one of shy. So they miss a lot of opportunity to have contact, to exchange with people from other countries. They really miss something. Uh, I can't say that. So 
Do you have five more seconds? <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Okay, I give her give a hand. Yeah, you get like a 3.25 out of 4 for that. <laughs> okay, this is my little gift for your participation. Okay, we have the printer make this. Okay, smile, happy, win. All those like sceneries, sort of spell out. Okay, so we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, this young gentleman will make a statement of disagreement, right? Oh, you will need this. Okay. <laughs> One minute. I would say uh, any kind of English teaching is better than nothing. It would be a crime if there was no English teaching. Uh, <laughs> let's see. English is pretty necessary for business reasons. I don't know. It's not really necessary if you just want to stay in Japan and do jobs here, but uh, it's pretty universal, so it's very handy. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I buy your argument too, to a certain extent. Okay? This is really good. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for your participation, and I'll try to, uh, I'd like to try to get you involved in the uh, discussion a little more uh, later on, and uh, uh, I have to ask for your cooperation to sort of like uh, get things rolling. But as you mentioned, I mean, the language education here is kind of knowledge-based, not the skill-based, right? That's for sure. And that's been going on for many, many years. But let's first think about the function of language, OK? Function of language is to exchange messages right and opinions and to and to exchange emotions and when the emo exchange of emotions through language succeeds there's a little or big heart love right and exchange of opinions goes well there's you know great agreement and to do things and of course exchanges messages that is good, successful communication. So, I mean, that's what language is. is. And when you think, we think about uh, Japanese English education, it's not, as uh, that young lady uh, suggested, it's not exchange basis, it's a knowledge basis. Okay, and uh, test-based, test-oriented, and teacher-driven, and uh, we cannot really learn the skills to communicate with people outside or people inside because it's our goal is test and performance, right? And. Of course, approach, when we talk about approach, we have to think about why we do that, right? I mean, English, do you think Japanese English education has any strategy or comparison to the kind of English education you have? What kind of language education did you have in English education at your home country? What kind of English education. What kind of format did you? Yeah. It's communicative. Yeah. yeah. And do you see any strategy behind your English education? I think it depends on the motivation. Yeah. Because we must speak English mm. before we can move to the next yeah. level mm. in the academic on um, in the academic ladder. But mm. it's not the case here. Mm. And after graduation, yeah, we have to communicate in English. Yeah. For jobs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I believe it's the motivation. So the students here, yeah, most of them, after mm -hmm. graduation, they have mm -hmm. to be uh, employed by the Japanese mm -hmm. companies, which do not require them mm -hmm. to use English, uh, apart from companies like Rakuten that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. That's right. So mm -hmm. I think this is that. 
my issue is the motivation, not the teaching methodology, mm -hmm. because we have a lot of methodologies, mm -hmm. methodologies being used mm -hmm. here in this school. Mm -hmm. So it's a motivation, is a, in a way, strategy for you or your country to uh, produce many English communi communicators in That's English, right? right? English, right? What about in your country? Um, well, we've got uh, a native-speaking country in Australia. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, English education there doesn't focus on grammar at all, which I really, like for example, I entered university and I studied, started studying Japanese. Yeah. I didn't know what <laughs> a verb, a noun, an adjective, yeah. adjectives were. Until I studied Japanese and then until I studied um, linguistics. So that was a bit of a disappointment. I think English education is English literature education rather than English education. Well, there was a time in Japanese education where there was clear strategy. It was during the Meiji era, right after, uh, I mean, Meiji restoration, we had to import all the knowledge is from outside, right? So we had to really focus on the reading and uh, reading documents, right? And so that we can steal all kinds of, you know, uh, technological uh, uh, information and of course academic information to sort of read, uh, to modernize our society. But need that that strategy became uh, less important, especially now. Well, the kind of strategy we need for the uh, Japanese English education is completely different from, sorry, I walk around, right? <laughs> I'm not used to this kind of uh, setup. Okay, what kind of strategy do you think we need for Japanese English education? Uh, I think What's more important is we're going to have to um, focus on speaking rather than debating or memorizing vocabulary and so on. So, this is the example when I was in high school, yeah. I didn't have any opportunities or chances to mm. challenge my English mm. in, in a proper way. Yeah. But we saw what we have to do is to employ someone who can speak English to the school mm. and uh, give children some opportunities. Not the skill, right? So we need to make our English education a little more skill based. I think so. Mm. Then, well, okay, so thank you very much. Let me move on. What do you think? What kind of strategy do you think we need for our English education? Or even vision? Yeah. Do we, I mean, he talked about education, but if I may change uh, my question a little bit, uh, too quickly, too quickly, okay? Uh, do you think our country have, has uh, any vision for English education or strategy? Why people th say, okay, say, now English is important, study English and go outside, sorry. If, okay, let me call my question. Okay, many corporations and even uh, politicians start to say all of a sudden, okay, English education is important and they are loud about it, right? Right? Why do you think they have started to say that? Why is communication 
Some people said, okay, Japan can be, okay, leave us alone, you know. We don't want to you know, join the TV, uh, okay. Uh, we, we don't want to, you know, join international community, you know. We don't want to be under the great influence of like America, you know. And some people say, we can be our own, right? Why do you think international communication is very important? Don't you think Japan can be alone? No? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, well, oh. I mean, strategy and vision in education and is very important. And uh, of course, for job seekers nowadays, English is very important, right? It's very important. And uh, but when I, whenever I teach TOEFL, a TOEFL test or IELTS, even, are uh, designed to test your ability to argue, right? So you go for standard test in English. Try to be sort of like a check your background knowledge and how much you can argue. So it's little more than communication, right? Little more than communication, higher level of communication. I mean, you really have to sort of like a uh, sort of you have to make your own argument, and you have to be able to support that in your using your background knowledge and using your experiences and so on. And is Japanese education designed? I mean, designed for that? Or not? Okay, I will ask you. Is Japanese, Japanese English education designed to sort of like a, uh, express your thoughts and ex uh, help you sort of argue with people with different ideas? No. No. Can't, I can't say what I want to express. Uh, <laughs> is it because you have English skills, or is it what? What? What is it? You, you said you cannot express yourself it, because of your English skill, or is it because you are not? I mean, you don't have experience in arguing with people or discussing with. People. For lack of experience. So, what we have found here is that it's not only a Japanese English education, right? Japanese high school education or elementary education, I mean, or education itself, it has different orientation. When is the last time you really argued with your friends in the class for some subject? When is the last time you sort of argue in a classroom situation for study? Do you remember? Well, I can change the different subject. When is the last time you worked on free competition? Either in English or Japanese. When was the last time you wrote, okay, Natsuya uh, Sumi no Sakubun, the school project? I mean, free writing. When is the last time? Do you remember that? Junior high school. Last time. Okay. So that means since you joined uh, high school or college, you haven't written anything that anything aside from something you given. Okay. When is the last time you wrote something? In high school, right? So when I teach TOEFL, it's difficult. Okay, what's your opinion? No. <laughs> what do you think about that? Same as his. 
So, again, global standard test of, I think, any language, well, especially English, really test you, your communication skills, but in a much deeper level, right? You have to be able to present your ideas in a very logical way using uh, supporting details and so on. And it's, I don't, and the reason I said I, I cannot find any suspect for the, you know, uh, impractical Japanese English education by blaming English educators only. It's education culture as a whole has to be the great suspect because, I mean, We have to sort of learn how to communicate with the friends by having very uh, profound arguments. And we have to learn how we can agree to disagree sometimes, right? I mean, you have to recognize the, the differences of the opinions and differences of ideas, different approaches to do certain things, but at the same time, you have to have certain degree of respect for the differences, right? And that's what's lacking in our education, right? How do you describe the flow of spring stream? Okay? Everyone, how do you describe the flow of the spring? I mean, flow of the spring stream. How do you describe? I mean, that's a question in Japanese elementary uh, Japanese text. And you have to start with certain answers, you know? It sounds like uh, birds singing, nothing else. So we conformity, as you may have, you know, realized conformity is our norm in Japanese education. And language learning cannot be conformed because it's the means of communication. It's, it's your individuality, right? It's your personality. Language is your personality. And you cannot conform yeah. that. OK, now. So we don't need like, uh, a strategy or whatever. We don't have to study English because it will help us to find a job or like to communicate with other people. Because I think that we can learn the language, just to learn a language. When I first started studying Japanese, it was in high school. Yes. Um, just like one class in the one direction. And I, I had no one to speak with in Japanese. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't, I, I liked it. And just like learning another language. So you don't need to learn something just to use it. You can just learn something just because you like it and because it's in order to open your mind, it's not to to find a job or whatever. Of course you can. Of course you can. But uh, when we I mean it's a means of communication and it's a skill, right? It's a skill. But uh, when we talk about English education here, okay, it is not designed even to help you find a job. It helps you pass the examinations, but it doesn't help you get a job. But it shouldn't, because learning language is just learning another way of seeing the world. Yes, I, I, that's I completely agree language with you. That's, yeah, that's what, yeah, thank you for helping me. That's the, that's the, that's the level we have to reach, right? I mean, it's a personal fulfillment. Right? It's a post, uh, it helps you uh, achieve your personal goals, right? It helps you enhance your uh, understanding the world and, and understanding the people. But it's not functioning in that way. Not convenient. Right? That's right. So we are talking about the same thing. Yeah? Okay? And, what time is it? Okay, good. So, now, why are young Japanese 
so hesitant about studying abroad. We want to get into this argument a little bit. Or, I mean, if you're interested, we can keep on going. But the reason I had to sort of put this statement here is that uh, I participated. I mean, I participated in a seminar two weeks ago. That seminar was organized by uh, Mansfield Foundation. The foundation started by the supporters of uh, Ambassador Mansfield to the uh, to Japan during the uh, Sam Bush era. And uh, they, are, I mean, they uh, were here in Sapporo, and they are going to visit different cities in in Japan, except for Tokyo and Osaka, because. In order to think about future relations, Japanese and U.S. relationship, they really wanted to uh, <coughs> meet and talk to the people outside of big cities. And uh, I mean, they are the leading scholars uh, on Japan from the U.S. And uh, they are uh, telling us many, many uh, interesting things and some something shocking and. And what's happening in the U.S. can be true in some other countries, too. Okay, uh, one of the professors uh, uh, on the panel said, 10 years ago, it was easy to start the class saying that Japan and its cultural heritage, and she had 50, 60 students. Now, if she said Japan and its cultural heritage, she cannot organize any class. No one signs up. So she, she had to say, Japan, you, uh, Japan, Korea, China, and their cultural heritages. Mm -hmm. Then they have more students. And uh, I mean, then she also said, our status in the US <coughs> academia is very low now. I mean, no one hates Japan. It's a Japan passing, right? Is Japan passing happening in Australia? Uh, I'm not quite sure, but mm. in terms of what I can tell you, in terms of language learning um, amongst languages learned in high school, it's maybe the second or third mm. most popular, behind mm. maybe um, Spanish and French. Mm -hmm. It's quite popular, and there's, I think it's there's a shift. Maybe maybe 20 or 30 years ago, if you ask people why they're studying Japanese in Australia for business, Economic reasons. Then, if you ask somebody studying Japanese, oh, this manga, this anime, this yeah. new cultural mm -hmm. phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So, I think the interest is there, but it's shifting. Okay. What about in your country? Uh, I'm from Finland, and yeah. in Finland, I think Korean and Chinese are surprising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What about in your country? New Zealand, it's more Japanese. I think uh -huh. Japanese is the most uh -huh. learned Asian language. I see. Yeah, traditionally, New Zealand has been very. Uh, Understanding well, uh, <laughs> understanding. Very close <laughs> yeah, close eyes. Yes, yeah. yes. But anyway, uh, we are not as recognized as thirty years ago. And okay, why is that? Why there's a such a notion of Japanese passing? Why is why is Japan less recognized now than before? Do, do you, can you give me your opinion? Okay, uh, there's a word. Have you heard of expression Japan bashing? Bashing? Okay, now it's passing. Japan means Japan bashing beat up Japan, right? When Japan was very strong. But now it's passing. Ignoring Japan. Why do you think that's happening? Do you understand my question? Passing.
Well, yeah. That's true. That's what they are concerned about. Okay, they are concerned about, okay, there was one professor from Washington University in Seattle who said, whenever the professors get together, where are the Japanese students? They have, well, what, University of Washington, Washington University, sorry, have 6,000 student body, and they have 600 Chinese, and they have to really look for Japanese, and for diversity of education, and diversity of college life, it's not healthy at all. They are looking for ja young Japanese to study. And that's happening everywhere. And, I mean, Japan, in the international community, still has some significant influence, right? And, uh, well, according to those, like, our, our Mansfield scholars, there are three things they have to worry about future Japan-U.S. relationship. And this can be true with our relationship with other countries. Change of all the prime ministers. I mean, there's no uh, steady policy makers exist in this country. That's quite uh, dangerous. I, I say dangerous almost. Yeah, because so quickly change. I mean, well, like, uh, when Abe comes up, he wants to make you know former military out of our self-defense, right? And five years ago, they decided to reduce the budget for the military building. So I mean, quite rapid changeover for the even the issue of defense and for support for the uh, what do you call uh, single mother family, single parent family, and that issue. Uh, policy for that issue changes quite quickly. So uh, people outside of Japan are concerned about change over, quick change of regard uh, of uh, policy makers. And of course, they are worried about Japan's rapid economical decline, right? So there are three things outsiders have to worry about. Because when our economy goes down, it's fairly, uh, uh, it's gonna hit the economy of other countries as well. So we really have to sort of like a, pay lots of attention to, as some of you have mentioned. We have to sort of like a, start building our relationship with, we have to renew relationship with other countries. And uh, all, I mean, let me get back to Mansfield's uh, panel discussion once again. And all of them said, I mean, it's got to start with people to people exchange. Right now, TPP could be a big issue, but human exchange is the basis of all kinds of relationships. It's like an inboxing body blow. It's not gonna hit you, knock you down at once, but it slowly affect you. In Japanese, uh, it's like a father's lecture and cold sake. Do you know why? It hits you later, right? Yeah. So, okay, now, we want to ask, I want to ask as many people as possible, why Japanese, young Japanese are so hesitant about going abroad or studying abroad? And People say job hunting starting at the, uh, in the junior year is a big hindrance for university students to go abroad. I mean, we understand, but tell us the real situation. I mean, is your global experience more important than visit? I mean, uh, uh, is visiting companies more important than uh, enhancing your international background? I mean, I want you to debate that, right? So I want to go around and, or you can ground here and express your opinion, okay? Uh, I want to ask the young ladies here, why a young Japanese going abroad or studying abroad or hesitant about having international experience?
okay? You don't have to represent this room or represent Japan. You just represent yourself, okay? Why? You are here and not in the US or England or Australia or New Zealand or Africa or some part of Asia. Why are you here? Now, Some people do feel comfortable being here, and I don't really criticize that. But uh, I, at the same time, realize that certain percentage of young of population of any country have to know outside well. Okay, uh, I said earlier that we send over 1,000 students abroad, and there are some students I who said I want to I don't want to go to a country where there's no washlet. So I tell them, <laughs> yeah, I said, bring shower toilet with you. <laughs> and they said, well, uh, there's a guy who studies at the SUNY uh, Stony Brook, Mr. Yoshida. I bought nice shower toilet, yeah, uh, and uh, by using the black tent. So there, I mean, you can carry washlets and go abroad. You know, you can use it anywhere, in Nepal or Bhutan or wherever. If the toilet is so important, right? <laughs> okay. I mean, that's what we used to be and go go abroad and carry the membership. That's one thing. Okay, you want to say something? Okay. Uh, yeah, we just have the this question in our in our class about about those topics. Yes. We talk about job hunting uh, Japanese student and we come up to the reason why they don't want to do with the master or study abroad because yeah. like the job hunting happened in the third year of the college student and after that year we asked them if what if you cannot find a job in that year they say we will stay for another year in the school to look for a job and then they also say that it's it's not necessary or we don't have the, they don't have the will to take the master degree because the company don't basically want to hire uh, master people because they don't want to pay that much for the master degree. So it takes me to the idea that like, so it indirect in 
discourage people to study master in Japan. So of course in Japan you don't want to study master degree. What like there's no point for you to study abroad for the master degree because you have to pay more money, you have to sacrifice your time and then it's very risky to find a job in the foreign country and if you got back to, to Japan you got paid the same as your bachelor degree. So it's I think it's one of the reasons mm. why Yeah. The problem is, okay, okay, I buy your argument and I think people believe that's one of the reasons, but if I think about it, okay, at the same time, college kids are having a difficult time finding a job here, right? Why? Why do you think college kids have a difficult time finding a job here? People say that university students have difficult time finding a job job they like in Japan, right? Job hunting is very difficult. Why do you think that? And I'll, I'll answer to, to your question, or i sort of like a, a, have a nice uh, discussion with you. Why do you think that new students have a difficult time finding a job? Do you think you can find a good job that you like? No? Why? Season, sort of like a coincide with a what do you call I mean, studying abroad or whatever. I think that's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, because many, okay, almost all the university students who go to, let's say, above average or above average universities rush to the same kind of job. And there are only few jobs available. They don't want to be different. They think. Just like a, what you call those like uh, uh, rodents that rush to the ocean. <laughs> yeah, they are like that. They don't want to be different. Don't you think it's the culture? Because we know Japanese culture is collect, uh, collectivistic. Yeah. So you have a, uh, you had a chance to go to US, which yeah. is individualistic but, culture. But, so yeah, <laughs> yes, but you, exactly. Yeah. But think about, OK, is that, isn't that dangerous for this society? But that's the culture. Should yeah, but the culture things. can be different. Mm. I mean, dif um, can be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, culture can. orientation yeah. can be dangerous. Mm. That can be dangerous. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we have to. Okay. We have to help our young people think differently. We have to have a diversity in thoughts, mm. right? That's where this international experience comes in. That's true. Right? That's true. And you know, there is a research that shows that a lot of people travel abroad because they are able to get better, better certificate to be able, especially people from the developing countries like China. And a uh, lot of uh, articles are showing that now, you know, Japan is growing and China is growing, but Japan has reached the peak. So there is no need to really rush people out there, but we have to rather re-strategize the, the, the situation here. So that is why there is a decline in terms of Japanese going abroad to study. In my country, when you get the certificate from advanced nation is respected, mm -hmm. so you know you, you're gonna get a good mm -hmm. job. But here it's not the case. And you know, we have the policy situation, yeah. we have the cultural situation, and then we have the individual motivation, mm -hmm. which can be instrumental or integrative issue. So it's, it's a very complex situation. Yes, but so, <laughs> yeah, I, have, I buy your argument. I mean, Japan has, uh, has a different needs mm -hmm. for youth, right? Mm -hmm. Probably for our youth, OK, this country requires flexibility, mm -hmm. toughness, to survive That's in an true. international competition, very true. okay? Which we had, mm. where we had to compete with uh, all the giant, political mm. giants, mm. political giants 
in the past. Because that time you were hungry. You were hungry for the technology. You were hungry for the money. Yeah. But now you are not. Yeah. So that is yeah. why there is but relaxation. Again, Do you agree? That, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. But that's not healthy either. Okay, you want to say something? Listening to what you were saying two minutes ago, I just thought maybe it's completely true. But it's completely false, maybe. But it could be possible that the Japanese government, uh, if, if he doesn't doesn't encourage so much to not go abroad. Maybe some, somehow it's a, little, it's a little, little afraid of creating a new generation of Japanese people more open-minded and with different ideas and who don't think like the rest of society and who could want to change things in the society and maybe government is afraid that if the thing, if this new generation wants to make things move, it's going to be messy and they will not be able to control. Uh, you are talking about conformity, right? So, like, uh, our go government will lose uh, control, control over the youth. I, because it's, yeah, I, I just think that they are too old to think about something new. Like, when you too say, old to think like, something when, new. when you <laughs> say about, like, why you say Japan passing among, like, in the image of the other country, not only around and globally in Japan itself, the population getting older. And like in some city, the population is even decreased every year. So yourself doesn't change. Uh, yourself is, doesn't get any news or have, been, have new English in the cold world. Mm. So, well, just in Australia, the English literature education that we get is very limited and small, purposefully, I believe. It, it, it teaches you to read some text and to understand some meaning. But to really think outside of the box, we're not taught that unless, of course, you go to a really, um, really expensive private institution, right? So, what do you think? How do you do you think simply just by teaching Japanese students English in a better way that Japan can change? No. No. No education. Not through education. I mean, through not only the English education, but the education in general. We have to really uh, respect individuality, right? And individuality and uh, uh, diversity of lifestyles, right? And we have to sort of like uh, respect those people who, have, who maintain small businesses. And we have to give lots of opportunity for young people to uh, join the uh, small businesses, right? Because 99% of uh, the Japanese economy is supported by the companies whose employee is less than 300. And which is, I mean, so the reason people say job hunting season prevents us from going abroad to have international study experience. Uh, that's why that, the reason I said bullshit is that we try to teach young people same value. Okay, if you study hard, get into a good school like Otaru Shoka Dairaku, your future is bright, you can get a job at Itochu, Sumitomo, and so on. That's illusion. But parents believe in that, schools believe in that, schools, well, that, actually, school teachers doubt, but in order to get the job done quickly, okay, don't think about going abroad, I mean, high school, don't go in, think about going abroad, the paperwork is too difficult, but they don't say that, don't dream. Dream after you graduate from high school, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> this why, why don't you make uh, a university career longer than one year more, and like we made like studying abroad mandatory? It's the case of my school in France. We have to go abroad. Yeah. Like, we have yeah. 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 Like internship or uh, just like abroad. Yeah. Some schools started to have that. That's why. Okay. Uh, Akita International is doing that, and some pri big private universities started to have uh, what they call liberal arts program. Was it a Kokusai or Joji or ICU? But it's not. I mean, we have 770 universities, and uh, only less than 10% is doing that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. I would like to know um, what motivates some of your students to be sent abroad. 
why do they want to go abroad if you could tell us we will appreciate it or oh, what's in it for me yes in your, in your case yeah of course i mean i would i mean many okay all those 80 percent of japanese corporations mm -hmm. listed in tokyo uh exchange of market, so market have have employed okay those ja young japanese who have studied abroad so major corporations are all ready to hire them yes. to okay uh enhance their international i mean global mm -hmm. business in force no, and not only the businesses even small girl, i mean all the functions of society needs, okay, pe young people who are conscious of what's happening outside, okay, mm -hmm. or we need lots of young people who can understand different values of life. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I mean, that includes languages and customs and so on, okay. yeah. And by doing that, I mean, some people, as you said, can get job, or some people can make a better contribution to the communities in which they live. Yeah. And by having that kind of experience, you can enhance your life, right? I mean, uh, our old values, when we were hungry, working 70 hours a week, okay, uh, was a value, I mean, respected for men. And the wives used to say, good husband is a healthy husband who stays out of home. But time has changed. So we need to have the many young ambassadors who can bring in uh, different values in this country and who can export some of the cultural treasures, uh, well, uh, wisdom life or wisdom living that we have that we can proud of and we want other people to know. So yeah. please, as educators, um, if you could tell us on the contrary, some of the reasons why some of the Japanese youth do not want to study abroad or do not want to engage in some exchange programs, and then how we can strategize to mm. motivate them. Well, we have a couple of educators here, so why don't we ask them? <laughs> <laughs> he is too. Is too. Okay. <laughs> so how can we strategize? That's a good one. Yeah. Wait. What about you? How can we strategize to send young people abroad? I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that is the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, sending young people abroad. I can returning tickets, then their lives will change, and we know, okay? I have a question. Um, when you're talking about changing, like, enticing the Japanese to that go and study abroad and try to create more opportunities for them, why do those Japanese that want to go abroad, like, what are their reasons for wanting to go abroad? So if you can understand why the ones that want to go abroad want to, you can use their ideas to help them. 
a Japanese school in Singapore, why did you choose to go abroad? Why did you choose to come here? <laughs> I chose to come here because I want to improve my Japanese and learn more about the culture. Mm. Uh, how did that interview, I mean, your experience here will influence your life in the future? I don't think it will influence my life in the future. It will open my mind to new cultures that are completely different from my own. Yeah. So okay, how would that influence your child education or uh, family development in the future? My future family. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to married to a man who's close minded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's for sure, right? Mm -hmm. You want how do you want kids to grow? I think even before I came to Japan I had that mindset, but coming to Japan just enhanced that. Yeah. We want that to happen to our young uh, mm -hmm. population. So why do the Japanese students that go abroad, the ones that you see the why do they go for? Why do they want to go? <laughs> Simple reasons. They are sick and tired of those Japanese people doing something on TV screen. They think, I better be in there. So they want to have just like new experience, exciting experience. They want to okay, pursue the possibilities. Within them, they know the possibilities, but the possibilities denied in our educational system, it denied in our society. But let me ask, uh, answer to the lady's question. Okay, uh, of course, we don't like the bureaucrats to interfere with whatever we do, but I heard, I mean, I attended like, uh, uh, seminars in Tokyo a couple months ago. I mean, uh, Lecture, I mean, seminars organized by a uh, man is from Hokkaido. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Terashima Jitsuro. He is from uh, uh, Sapporo, and he is at present of Tama University. Hmm. Tama University, and uh, he you, he used to work for um, Mitsui Kusan, right? Strategy. Office of Strategy Development. And anyway, he invites many different people to uh, give different lectures. And uh, one of the, our lecturers was uh, Mr. Kaishi Yasuo, uh, Yakaishi Ko, who used to be the uh, Japanese ambassador to the United Nations. And he said uh, he was, uh, that he was a member of a board, of, board for the uh, Monbusho to develop uh, international exchange program for university students. And the plan they are working on right now is, okay, this is amazing plan, and I don't know how you respond to this. There is about 11 million people who are about 18 in Japan, about 18, 11 million, okay? And they want to send 10% of that population abroad or more than one year. So, I think our country is a little desperate to bring in new elements from outside of people who think different ways, who can, just like you, who are a little more open-minded, open to new ideas, and really uh, uh, who can really, uh, well, develop ideas based on different values and so on. Right? I mean, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, okay, uh, Japanese home uh, appliances, I mean, the reason they, why they pay, right? They are too complicated. They are too sophisticated. And customers don't need that sophistication. They need a refrigerator who the, that doesn't speak. <laughs> <laughs> You don't want the refrigerator to say, welcome home, open my door, and get what you do. Yeah. I mean, so we started to think what we do is good. I, what we do is universal. 
what we do is accepted everywhere. I mean, we have to get rid of that notion. And we have to see with, uh, I mean, we have to move along with the global trend. That's why uh, we have to. Uh, we want to see many young people go outside. And uh, OK, right now, Mr. Um, Dr. Clunky is sort of videoing us. And uh, we like to sort of like, uh, have him talk about and summarize the discussion a little bit. Summarize the You're, discussion. Yeah. <laughs> the, entire <laughs> the entire discussion in five yeah. minutes. <laughs> Japanese bureaucracy is bad. Yeah. Japanese kids should go abroad. How's that? Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Okay. Uh, well, I kind of uh, let me summarize today's uh, you know discussion with you guys, and I really enjoyed sort of having. Uh, Global exchange with you guys, and we studied from you know English education, and then we studied to you know, why are you young Japanese so interested in studying abroad? And since we have some international you know uh, students here, we like to, I like to ask you you know I mean, you told me about your experience here, and I want to sort of like, uh, hear your experience uh, in Japan and how it's going to affect your uh, future life. And you. Yeah. I was going to thank you much for sharing that. Um, I think when you go to another country, you have to test and um, try to discover another way of seeing things, other value, mm -hmm. so you can take distance with uh, the stereotypes and all, what you, all the norms of your society, so you're more open minded. You learn to see things in another way, you think in another way, mm -hmm. so you can. Another point of view when you have a problem, you can avoid things in another mm -hmm. angle. Do you want that? Um, do you want to experience, I mean, share that kind of experience with the Japanese students? Or do you want to tell the Japanese students about your uh, experience and benefits yes. in living abroad? Yeah, because yeah. I think you should do the same. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you think? Uh, do, do they respond to you in a positive way? Yeah. yeah, you keep on telling them your experience. <laughs> I'm from, I've been, like, uh, having dinner with Japanese people who doesn't, didn't speak English at all. So, yeah. and so they didn't, they haven't had any chance to speak with the, with that same stuff. And so they asked me, like, oh, how is studying abroad? And I was telling them that it. So, and I asked them, do you want to go abroad? Mm -hmm. And they, they told me that. Oh, isn't it hard to be like far away from your family and like you know, <laughs> sad and stuff? Yeah. So they're really afraid of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 So, mm -hmm. so I said that like, you guys say it's like funny, so you don't. Yeah. Yeah. So they are. Right. Yeah. Well, parents are a little bit protective nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you? Do you? What is? How has your experience been? Uh, well, I've only been here three months, but uh, I've enjoyed it so far. Mm -hmm. As far as like the family thing goes, like, we have Skype now, so that's right. I talk to my family like once a week. Yeah. So I mean, they you really don't miss they, your family. See, they, I think they miss me quite a bit, but you don't miss me. And do you think uh, it's been a positive experience for uh, you? Definitely. Mm -hmm. like, and do you, I mean, I hope you can convey your positive experience to your Japanese friends and encourage them to. I'm trying to get him to study. The okay. <laughs> <laughs> good job. So he's been a very good positive, positive experience, I mean, uh, influence for you, right? So, are you from Japan or okay? So, what do you think about hearing those stories? Yeah. So, 
Well, money issue will not be that big in the future, probably uh, as of next year. You know? So please check on the web, uh, website of Mobile Shop. Okay? Uh, I heard that those who try to uh, pursue a degree abroad can get quite significant amount of non-refundable scholarship. With, I don't think there's any string tied to you, no strings attached. Yeah. So our government is okay, collecting all the donations from private corporations like Lawson or Uniqlo or all those corporations who want to hire uh, Japanese students who have studied abroad and they are putting in money and uh, Mongusho is uh, managing that fund to send uh, students abroad. What's happening? Okay. Is there any other international students here? Yeah. Okay. So what do you? Uh, uh, I what think you? studying here has made me also really want to work abroad. Mm -hmm. People are studying and working, even though they are a bit different. They are still being abroad. So I think that way. And the reason why I originally left Finland is because Finland is in a pretty much similar situation. Like a a lot of old people and then. Young people, they don't want to leave, and I left because no one else was leaving, and I don't want to work with people who don't want to leave. <laughs> okay. So I okay. Left. Good. Yeah. Good spirit. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, you have to. Look, it's your responsibility to influence Japanese students yeah. by telling you your personal experience. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, if they're talking about financial issue, I, I should tell him, tell him that Japan is one of the ex most expensive country. If you say financial issue, then it should be the biggest problem for me because I'm from Vietnam and compare the average salary of Vietnam and Japan is amazing. It's like this yeah, yeah. And I haven't seen snow before. I haven't been in any cold country. My mom called me every day to ask what I eat, how about the weather, can I survive? <laughs> of course, my, uh, the parents are super uh, protected, but it's a great experience to, to see that you can live in different conditions. You can survive without any help from the army. Yeah. Well, money issue, I forgot to tell you in earlier stage. Okay, my father says, okay, I'll give you the fund that can enable you to think complete your university education in Japan, and you can use that for the U.S. That only lasted for one year. <laughs> so for three years of my education, I had to work, right, and get scholarship to do that. And you, I mean, you can overcome all the, almost all the issues that are stopping you if you have strong will to study it. And I mean, her story is a good example. Okay, anyway, uh, I asked uh, those international students studying at Otaru University uh, to Commerce to influence many Japanese young people to go abroad. And, uh, and I want those young uh, Japanese people who have studied abroad to uh, become the solid basis of uh, future prosperity of Japan in terms of spiritual richness, not necessarily in a uh, material richness. Okay? Thank you very much for having me here. I enjoyed being